Uh, welcome to the Masters of Arts Management Lecture Series. Um, we are really happy to have you today here at Hamburg Hall uh, with me. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm looking out. It's so exciting. So I'm seeing lots of familiar faces. I see lots of students, of course, but I also see a few alumni. Raise your hand if you're a MAM alum. Woohoo! I also see lots of great of our Pittsburgh arts community um, out there. Thank you so much for coming today. I hope that you uh, have an uh, enjoyable uh, lunch time with us. Please do get pizza as well if you're up for it. It's kind of a stupid thing, I understand. So, um, as I said, we're going to get started here. So, here's the deal. I am not going to, we are really super excited to have um, Aubrey Burgauer here today with us. I am not going to read her bio. I am not going to tell you a bunch of boring things about where she went to college because hopefully you did some research before so that you have excellent, excellent, excellent questions for her at the end, which we want to get to, so I don't want to waste any more time. For those of you who I, and now I'm seeing some faces I haven't seen before, so I'm Jessica bowser Acre, and I'm the relatively new uh, uh, program director here for the Mar Master's of Arts Management program. Welcome, welcome. Um, but again, no big notes from me. We brought Aubrey here today to inspire you, um, all of my arts management students. I think that what she has done in the last few years is take a challenge that many of us are super familiar with, okay? I am super passionate about this thing, music, theater, art, whatever it is, but I know that there's these other people that would like it, but I can't seem to get them to come in the door. And if I do get them in the door, I can't get them to stay, all right? So she's been thinking about this problem, and she's been going around and talking to a lot of people about some of the solutions that her and her team at the California Symphony and other places that you've worked have come up with. And that is it from me. Let's hear from her. Um, again, thank you so much. Let's give her a welcome to Aubrey. Thank you. Okay, show of hands. Who here, uh, when you are working at an arts organization someday, wants to have a growing customer base, an enlarging donor pool, so that you can do all the projects and initiatives you want to do? Who wants that? Good answer. <laughs> and just so I have an idea of who's in the room, who here wants to someday work at a, or is already working for those alums, at a performing arts organization? An orchestra, opera company, theater, dance? Okay, good. And then who wants to be in the museum world, visual arts? Okay. And then is there a third category? None of the above? A couple. Policy, organizations, service organizations. Okay. Other things, yeah. Good, great. Okay. So by way of introduction, one more time, my name is Aubrey Bergauer, and I am on a mission to change the narrative for arts organizations. A lot of people know me from my work at the California Symphony. I just wrapped up five years there this summer. I was the executive director for the last five years. And what you need to know about the California Symphony is that during those five years, we nearly doubled our audience and quadrupled our donor base. Who wants to double their audience and quadruple their donor base someday? Good. Uh, this summer I said I was leaving to make an impact, uh, a bigger impact beyond one organization. I've been working with different organizations across the country now these last few months. Next week there's going to be a big announcement of how I get to do this on an even bigger scale. And uh, all of this is just by way of introduction. So some background for you before coming to California. I spent about a decade in Seattle. They're working for the leading institutions, Seattle Symphony, Seattle Opera, and the Bumbershoot Music and Arts Festival. And that's to say my experience is at organizations of all sizes. And at every one of those organizations, we had the same problem. That problem is that the struggle is real. <laughs> Nervous laughter. Uh, <laughs> real laughter. OK, what do I mean by that? The struggle is real. I mean that the current narrative for arts organizations is that it is a struggle to balance our budget every year. It is a challenge to continue growing our audiences. It is a, a challenge to find the donor support that we need to do this work and to do innovative work. In other words, it is a challenge, it is a struggle to stay relevant. Now, what are the symptoms of this problem? There are a few. Uh, the first is that for American orchestras in particular, 90% of first-time attendees never come back again. 90% of first-time attendees at American orchestras never come back again. That's a statistic from the League of American Orchestras. And whether or not that's true for every orchestra, the reality is it's very similar across the country and true for other performing arts organizations as well. 
Another symptom of this problem is that for American orchestras, this happened in 2013, the earned revenue that comes from single ticket sales surpassed the earned revenue that comes from subscription, season ticket sales. It used to be subscriptions funded the majority of our earned revenue. I see nodding heads, good. That's, those scales tipped on average nationwide in 2013. What does this mean? It means our audiences, both of those statistics mean our audiences are becoming less loyal. That's a problem, the struggle is real. The third and final reason why uh, this is happening or why the struggle is real is there are virtually no efficiencies to be realized when running an arts organization. <laughs> yeah, more laughter, it's true. There, are, there, you know, there, are, there is no way to make it cheaper. You can't, for example, play Beethoven faster. <laughs> you can't do it with fewer players. It's the same number that's called for no matter the piece of music, particularly at an orchestra. Um, it never, ever, ever gets cheaper next year than this year. It is, it is an incredibly labor-intensive industry, on stage and off. It takes people to do this work. So all of those things combined, audiences becoming less loyal, the costs continue to rise. It's a challenging business. That is, that is the reality we live in. So struggling is not new, but we are at a tipping point, I contend. And I am here today to talk about why that is, and what we can do about it. This is a talk about solutions, and the California Symphony is a case study in how to defy the trends of this industry. So first, let's go a little deeper into what exactly is causing this problem. There are four reasons this problem is happening. The first is an incorrect definition of relevance. So a lot of organizations are really asking the wrong question. We ask questions like, should we serve the art, or should we serve the community? Now that probably sounds like a fine question, but the problem is that, you know, that would make sense if we were a publicly funded organization, if we were, you know, funded by the government, but we are not. Especially in America, unlike European arts organizations, we are by and large funded by people. You know, if you look at the, the revenue breakdown for any, any arts organization, and you're looking at earned revenue, contributed revenue, the gala, all those kind of things, and then eventually some foundation corporate support, it's like 80% on average. The revenue comes from people, not from institutions. We are in the business of people. Now, why does this matter? Because people are who decide if we're relevant. We as organizations, we don't get to decide if we are relevant. People decide that and they tell us that with how they spend their money. So, the number one quality of top relevant brands is that they are customer obsessed. In other words, focused on the people. So to put some data behind this, there is a firm in San Francisco where I live. They're called Profit and every year, they're a marketing and branding firm. Every year, they release a relevance index for all kinds of organizations, all brands. And the number one quality that determines who's on that list is how much they are focused on people, how much they are customer obsessed. We're talking brands like Marvel, Apple, what else, Netflix. <coughs> brands that are focused on the customer, on their people. That's what makes them relevant more than any other indicator. The second reason why this problem is happening is because most arts organizations have really antiquated marketing. We are now 20% into the 21st century just about, and I'm still hearing arts organizations say, I already see nodding heads, let's get ourselves into the 21st century. The 21st century is passing us by. It's almost 2020, one fifth of the century is almost over. And so this is a problem just mentally that that's where a lot of arts organizations stand. And in fact, there is one marketing guru, his name is Mark Schaefer, I love his books, and he says in his most recent book, The Marketing Rebellion, that two-thirds of a brand's marketing are not done by the brand. Two-thirds of any brand's marketing are done by the customer, by the people. And what does that mean? It means like social media, or word of mouth, or reviews. Two-thirds of the, of the activity and the buzz about a brand come from people, come from our customer. Only one third is what the organization is actually putting out and producing. 
So we have got to empower our customers to do this marketing for us. We've got to be customer obsessed. The third reason why this is happening is because our audiences are not reflective of the communities that we serve. NEA data shows that the demographic breakdown of arts attendance for classical music is that in America it is 83% white, about 5.5% Hispanic, another 5% African American, and that final about 7% other unidentified. If you look at the 2010 census, 72% of the United States was white at that time. Now, as you know, we're about to take another census. That data is already shifting. But even in 2010, almost 10 years ago, classical music and arts organizations in general were over-indexing for white people. You guys know this. Everybody knows this, right? Yeah, nodding heads. OK, so to put some more data behind this, Pew Research says that 22 states, this is more recent data, 22 states and 109 counties across those states have since become, since the 2010 census, become majority non-white. 22 states, almost half of our nation, and 109 counties within those states have become majority non-white. The Brookings Institute, to add another third party piece of data, says their projection is that by 2045, the, U, the U US will become, as a whole, minority white. You and I, We'll be in this business in 2045. We will still be working. We will still be managing these arts organizations. The changing demographics in this country cannot be ignored by our arts organizations anymore. The fourth reason why, oh, bad slides. Fourth reason why this is happening is we are not on the same team. There's a couple ways this plays out in our organizations. We are not on the same team in terms of, at an orchestra it often plays out musicians versus management, a very us versus them mentality. Another way this plays out across all kinds of arts organizations is our siloed organizational structures. We've got the marketing department and the development department and the education department and the production department and operations and, and all of these things are siloed activities that are keeping us from working together, keeping us from being obsessed with our customer. We've got to find a way to get on the same team. So these are all the reasons why the struggle is real, why this is all happening. So if that's the problem and that's why it's happening, let's talk about solutions. The solution is in three parts. The first is to listen to our customers. If we want to be customer obsessed, let's hear what they have to say. The second reason, or second part of the solution rather, is to focus on loyalty. If we said at the beginning, so many of our patrons are not loyal, let's find a way to design for and to incentivize that behavior. And the third part of the solution is to be inclusive. How do we get on the same team? How do we uh, diversify our audiences? And we're going to put some data behind that. So first up listening to our customers. The way we listen to our customers is called UX research, user experience research. And in 2016, the California Symphony set out to do that. We embarked on a project called the Orchestra X Project. And we affectionately named it after Google X, their research arm at that company. And we said, we want to hear from people who should go to the symphony but don't. Meaning, we said we want millennials and Gen Xers who are smart, culturally aware, who do have expendable income, and do go to other live entertainment options. But for whatever reason, just don't go to the symphony. We said, if that's you, we want to hear from you. And so we had some people sign up for this. We said you can come to as many concerts in the season as you want. It's $5 each. This was not a money-making venture. This was a research project. We said, uh, and, and not free because free has no value, free has a high dropout rate. Free means uh, you don't go through the purchase path, which is part of the experience. So we said, okay, $5. And you can come to as many concerts as you want, but one concert in particular is required as a shared experience among all of our participants. And what we learned from that uh, is a lot. We said, we promise to listen only. Remember, listen to our customers. We promise to listen only and not jump to defense, which I'm here to say is an exercise that is tremendously difficult and brutal. And 
what we heard was not one person saying, you know, I need a shorter concert. Or if you could only play more Beethoven, or play more fill in the blank composer, or if you could just do more Harry Potter concerts. No, nobody said that. Instead, everybody said, uh, I felt awe. You know, the music, the music itself was awe inspiring, but everything else is the problem. They said, Your website reads like inside baseball. <laughs> They said, I go to your website and there is so much technical language and jargon. I don't know what I'm reading. They said, oh, and it's in paragraph form. They're like, you're in the world of Twitter, Aubrey. Like, knock it off, basically, is what they said. Uh, they said, I don't know what to wear. It's not that I don't want to dress up. It's that I don't know what to wear and I want to make sure I'm appropriate and I fit in. They said, I can't read your seat map. Your ticket path is clunky. It sometimes doesn't work very well on my phone. I don't know that A, I, a, I had to assume A was the first row. It doesn't actually say. It's not totally clear where the stage is. You know, all these little things. Your program notes are so dry. They literally said, your program notes read like a wine description. That is like the most Northern California comment I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> But it did occur to me, you know, we talk about tasting notes and we have program notes and suddenly, yeah, I heard somebody go, ah, yeah, that was my reaction too, like, okay, you know? And so what we learned is that, you know, I don't know when to applaud, all these things. And so what became so clear to me is that among smart adults, there is a big knowledge gap between what somebody knows who doesn't have the type of arts education background that a lot of us had in this business, and then those of us who have been in school for these jobs, who have worked at these organizations, a, a huge knowledge gap exists. And I had to realize, and I, and I asked myself, Aubrey, why do I preach that the decline in music education in this country is one of the top reasons why we are seeing attrition in our audiences, and yet, I had done nothing to change the way I talk about our art form and our product. I'm like leaving that knowledge gap wide open in the work I do at my organization. And now I realize nobody else is going to fill that gap. Arts education isn't going to come back overnight. That means it is our duty as arts administrators in this country to provide education, to fill in that knowledge gap and fix that so we are serving our customer. So how do we do that? Content marketing. Does anybody know that term, content marketing? Just a couple hands. Content marketing is, uh, I'll give you some contrast here. A typical marketing effort, whether it be a postcard or a social media post or some other uh, piece or message produced by an arts organization, I see a lot of this online. Don't forget, concert this Sunday. Get your tickets. Or buy now, click here. A lot of that is what we see. I see, okay, it's like another nervous laughter portion. I see some <laughs> smiles. Okay. Um, you know, that's, that worked 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Now, content marketing is using educational information as a means to stimulate interest in a product. That's the definition. So how do we do that? Blog posts, videos, um, what else? Let's see, uh, oh, what am I saying? The, like uh, graphics, um, all kinds of ways where we can fill in those blanks, where we can tell stories about our product. We can provide that information, interesting information meant to stimulate interest in the product. So then when we are doing that, what are we doing? We're filling in the knowledge gap, we're focusing on the customer, we're giving them what they need to know so that they can be prepared to enjoy the experience and not feel so isolated by it. So here's one of my favorite examples. And this goes back to the program notes. The Orchestra X focus group said, you know, wh whoever wrote your program notes, you know, were dry like the wine, remember? So uh, they give this piece of feedback and then somebody says, but wait, Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony, this was on the program, they, the required program they saw, Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony should have never happened. And then somebody else chimes in and says, that's right. His first symphony was a disaster, basically a failure. He waited 20 years before writing his second. And then when he did, somebody else chimes in, it was so great, it was marvelous. 
Like these newcomers are saying this, and I'm like, okay, what alternate universe have I just entered that like suddenly this is what I'm hearing? So I probe a little deeper, and somebody says, yeah, whoever wrote those program notes should have written those other ones that were like the wine description. And I said, the same person did write those program notes. And so what, what came out as I continued to question was the other program notes, even though written by the same person, were much more musicological in nature. It, it became clear this group didn't even know the names of the instruments in the orchestra. And so then something like instrumentation makes no sense. Uh, words like concerto were foreign to them. So the other program notes that were written in a much more musicological way were not getting the job done. Wine description. But the program notes that were the story behind the music had them remembering it so much that they were repeating it back to me two weeks later. So you apply that to content marketing, and that's what I mean. It's storytelling. It's, it's why is this work important, whether it's an orchestral piece of music or an, a piece of art hanging on the wall. It doesn't matter. Like It has a meaning, and it has a story behind it, so we can share that with people. And that is meant to stimulate interest in the product we do. So you combine that with the earlier stat I said that two-thirds of our marketing is not done by the organization, it's done by others. When we make shareable content, interesting content, non-salesy content that is actually selling, because it's telling people how they can learn, then we start developing a marketing machine that is empowering other people to be prepared for the experience we're offering to share that with others. You see how that changes? So, if part one of the solution is to listen to our customers and respond, then the second part of the solution in parallel to that is to design for the desired behavior, which is loyalty. What's so interesting about loyalty to me is that orchestras were, in fact, early adopters of a very prominent loyalty model today, and that is the subscription model. Years ago, 40, 50 years ago, even longer, orchestras were selling the majority of our tickets via subscription. And so when somebody says subscriptions are dead or the scales have tipped and when people are buying single tickets and we're just not going to go back, I don't believe that because the subscription model today, everywhere else, is way more popular. Uh, yeah, that's like a big head nod at the back. I like it. Um, like Netflix, have you heard of it? Yeah. <laughs> Um, what else is on subscription? Like my dog's pet food, this is kind of embarrassing, my dog's pet food gets sent to my door every two weeks because it's on subscription, but man, it makes my life easier. What else is on subscription? Clothing. Clothing, yeah, that's a good one. Spotify, Spotify. what else, jewelry? Accessories. Oh, accessories, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say it again. Software. Software, yeah. Yeah, so many things. I mean, okay, here's also embarrassing. Like razors, like I bought razors, it, it, like, or Harry's, Dollar Shave Club, all those, you know, all those kind of things. Like, subscriptions are everywhere, and so the subscription model is not dead. So what happened then for orchestras? Well, as I said, 40, 50, 60 years ago, that model worked just fine. Subscriptions filled the majority of our houses. And then you combine that with what I said at the beginning, the fixed costs rise every year. It gets more expensive to do what we do. And that meant a couple things over time. One, it meant that our orchestras became more savvy to our collective credit. Orchestras became much savvier marketers. So as much as I'm ranting on marketing, it is true that orchestras did adopt social media, did adopt digital marketing. So it's not that we haven't adapted at all. Uh, orchestras became much more savvy fundraisers. Because whatever we don't make in ticket sales, we got to raise in contributions, right? So orchestras became incredibly, uh, incredibly savvy, incredibly effective at fundraising. We know how to ask for a gift in every way possible, in person, mass mailings, uh, foundations, corporate, planned giving, online, direct mail. I mean, you name it. We know how to ask for money, right? Okay, so that's not bad in itself, but what happened is you combine all those things together and we actually ended up disincentivizing loyalty. Who here has heard of like mission creep or mission drift? Yeah, a lot of you, good. Uh, it's like the goal got away from us a little bit, that we became very effective in the short term. Make the sale, get the gift, but over time the costs are going up and it meant that over time we were disincentivizing that loyalty behavior that we need. So let's look at it this way. 
I'm going to walk you through what sort of typically happens at an orchestra, and, and really any arts organization this is true for. And then I'll show you by comparison what we did at the California Symphony to, to try to design for the loyalty. So the typical audience journey at an orchestra, let's say somebody comes for the first time. What happens after their first experience? They get a phone call asking for a donation. Okay, more nervous laughter, okay. Um, <laughs> they get a phone call asking for a donation, telefunding, and then the marketing department says, well, wait, 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 because we are so smart and savvy, we have that tracking cookie placed on their browser and we're gonna sit, show them digital ads everywhere, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, everywhere else on the internet. We're just gonna follow them around and show them ads for our next concert. The development department says, well, wait, 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 we've got a fundraising appeal going out in the mail. Let's put those new pros prospects on it too. They came once, maybe they wanna give. Okay, and the marketing team says, well, also, also, we've got our next season we're getting ready to announce. We've got to put those people on the mailing list for the season brochure because they came once. Maybe they're ready to buy the whole season. <laughs> and you already heard me say 90% of first-time attendees never come back again. And what's happening is there is a bombardment of information happening when you've only been to the organization one time. So then what happens? Let's say, let's say of the 10% that do come back, they, they do, they come back. So they're now what, a multi-buyer, a repeat buyer, right? What happens? All of this, this whole rigmarole happens all over again. All the messages, telefunding, uh, telemarketing, digital ads, brochures in the mail, direct mail appeal, all of that rigmarole all over again. Some of those people sort of start working their way up this jungle gym and some people do subscribe some people do eventually become renewing subscribers. Same messages all the time, but they, they just kind of, they're in, so they're, they're going with it. Eventually, when people become a donor or a major donor, our organizations get really focused at that point on how to facilitate the relationship with those people. Man, do major donors have a plan at most organization. We call it moves management, we call it a cultivation plan, like these things exist at the top of the pyramid. So if all of this looks like a crazy mess, there's a really good reason for that. It's because it is a crazy mess. I call this the free-for-all model. So by comparison, what we did at the California Symphony is we said, we are going to make a patron journey that has one next step for you, no matter who you are, and one next step only. So if you're a first time attendee at the California Symphony, the only thing we ask you to do is to come back again. That's it. We have many communications that make that invitation, that make that offer. There's a lot of strategy that goes into that, but we don't do everything else. We are not soliciting them for a season brochure, or a subscription rather. We are not soliciting them for a donation. One next step and one next step only. Then when they do come back a second time, then they become a prospect for season tickets. They've indicated some habitual attendance. So now we're ready to invite them to become a part of the full season. And then eventually once they become a subscriber, all this is another important data point in the field, all the research shows, we said 90% of first timers don't come back again. For season ticket holders, the national average is 50% of first year subscribers do not renew that subscription. So it's a major, another major drop off point. So we said even for first year subscribers, we are not soliciting them for a donation yet because the only thing that we need them to do is renew that subscription to come back again. And then all the research shows that once somebody is a second year subscriber or longer, man, are they loyal and sticky. They do come back. Those renewal rates are very high, but it takes a lot of work to get somebody there. If the previous model was the free-for-all model, this is about developing relationships over the long term. I call this the long haul model. And it's also important to note that in the previous example, we had our silo departments. We had the development department and the marketing department. And here at the California Symphony, we said we have one patron loyalty team with the customer at the center serving them in every one of these steps. So, part one of the solution is 
listen to your customers, act on that feedback, fix the experience. Part two is in parallel design for loyalty. Part three, as I said, is that inclusion and diversity like actually really matters. So diversity is a noticeable problem at our institutions. We've already said that. And in the Orchestra X project, a new person at my orchestra noticed it right away. And yes, it did negatively impact their experience. So similar to the last step of the solution, I'll share with how mo most organizations approach diversity and then what we've done differently. Most orchestras approach diversity through programming. And especially when we're looking at cultural or ethnic diversity, it's siloed programming. We want to do a Dia de los Muertos concert for Latinx audiences. Or in February, we will program our composers of color for Black History Month. Or we'll do some other program that's female composers, something like that. This is how most orchestras approach diversity. And it's not that it doesn't work at all. What happens is those specific programs do bring people. Oh, we want young people, Harry Potter movie concert, bam, sold out. Like, it works. But the problem is just like everything else I said, most of those people do not come to other programming. And then we're, I see nodding heads, good. And then we see, I see my peers in this field, we all scratch our heads saying, why is that? Why don't they come to the traditional repertoire? Well, we fed it to them in silos, right? Okay, so instead for diversity, how this works is it doesn't start with programming. It starts internally. So at the California Symphony, uh, the Orchestra X project was 2016. By 2017, we had rolled out a commitment to diversity across every facet of the organization. We said, for the programs we do on stage, this is part of it, we said for the programs we do on stage, we will have 20% of our programming be dedicated to female composers, composers of color, or living composers could be white males. 20%, the national average at the time was 2%. So we were committing 10x the national average. Uh, and that wasn't by specific programs, that was across the season. In parallel, the other facets of the organization, we said look at our guest artists. For every white male that's on the list of guest artists to bring in or guest conductors to bring in, we will also add to that list a female or person of color. I had to take a big look at my hiring practices for bringing people into the office to make a more diverse staff. I had to look at things about my unintentional biases and how do we create a process that is fair and equitable that attracts a diverse <coughs> candidate pool so that I'm not inadvertently weeding out people who should have this opportunity to move through the, the flow of hiring process, right? We started seeing the staff change we started seeing our programming change. For the board, we said the same thing. For every white male we vet and recruit for this board, can we please add to that a female or person of color? Across the entire organization, the fabric of who we were started changing internally. Then you combine that with the programs that people were seeing on stage. And then, and we already started seeing a slight change in our audience from that and some revenue. And then we said, we better put our money where our mouth is. And we're a nonprofit, right? So it's not like we're rolling in dough. We said we have an idea for a small pilot project where we could test this. So we said the same season, this was the 17, 18 season, we said we're gonna roll out some advertising in English and in Spanish. So to tell you about our community, the California Symphony is based about 20 miles east of San Francisco. The community is about 25% Hispanic and Latino. So we said, okay, let's try rolling out ads in English and in Spanish. And in the same way we do different versions of our ads targeting the pop culture lovers, the traditionalists, or family ads for the family concerts, that kind of stuff with advertising, uh, and that kind of siloing is good, it's targeting, not siloing. Uh, we said let's run some ads in Spanish, just translating our regular ads, targeting Spanish speakers. Minimal investment was a pilot test. So what started happening is, yeah, some of those people started clicking, at the very beginning, they would click on the ad and then the website was in English, but they were still buying tickets. So later we eventually got some funding to redevelop the whole website, so now the website has an English-Spanish toggle, but at the very beginning, that's all it was, it was just an ad. We already started seeing changes in our audience just from running an ad. Then, we said, how can we 
further this. And then it starts to really snowball. Okay, so we got the grant to do the website in English and in Spanish. Then one day, people started messaging us on Facebook in Spanish. How do I get tickets to your next concert? Well, good thing that the staff was more diverse because what had been happening is at the beginning we had to really figure it out. But you know, you can't like call your translator and get back to that customer 24 hours from now. Like that is not how this works, right? So eventually what started happening, because we had a more diverse staff, one of my staff members was a Latina woman and she said, you know, Aubrey, uh, I, I grew up speaking a little bit of Spanish, I'm not fluent. I would like to use my professional development budget to take Spanish classes. And I think she was our director of operations and education. She said, I think that will really help me uh, with some of this stuff like on the fly translation in the office, but also in my work with our underserved communities that are largely Spanish speaking parents of those children. Would that be okay with you, Aubrey? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that started happening. So then I had somebody on my staff who was helping us with these kinds of things on the fly because that's what she was doing and because we had that representation. So to put a finer point on all of this and some numbers, I said we put some numbers behind it. I mentioned the California Symphony, the community is about 25% Hispanic and Latino. That same season, because we had success with steps one and two, we already had been significantly growing our audience. That season, we added more performances. So here's where you gotta do the math with me. We had added that season 33% more seat inventory. If we were to grow our audiences to be representative of the community that we serve, we would grow our Latinx audiences from a baseline that was about two or three percent on any given night, Latinx audiences before any of this work. If we were to grow from that two to three percent baseline to 25 percent of our audience being Latinx, and then do that again with Asians. The baseline for California Symphony was six to eight percent Asians. If we were to grow it to be about 10 to 15 percent to be reflective of the community. Every one of those newly added seats would be filled with need to add more. Diversity matters, not just because it's the right thing to do, not just because our feet are being held to the fire on this issue, not just because um, like we need to do this to get a grant or something, but because there is money on the table and it is a smart business decision to realize that. So if those are our solutions, let's talk about some conclusions. Three conclusions. The first is all of this is about creating a gateway to relevance. We have, we want, we have, we want newcomers saying, I wasn't alienated. I didn't feel awkward. I didn't, nobody judged me. Nobody shushed me. We want that. We want, uh, people messaging us in Spanish and being able on staff to respond to that in that language. We want young people to come. We want old people to come. We want newcomers to come. We want long timers to come. We want all of these things. It is not just about one demographic. It's about people, remember? It always goes back to people and back to our customer. And it is about being able to say, I see you. No matter who you are, no matter where on that spectrum of loyalty or participation you fall, I see you and I hear you and you are welcome here. So the second conclusion is, this is work. It is time, yes, it takes time to do these things, it takes time to do these loyalty initiatives and steps and programs, but I now think more than the time it takes, it is cognitive work. The default of human nature, default, it's just how it is, is to gravitate toward people like us, period. That's just human nature, and, and to know that is important. So therefore, it is cognitive work to be aware that that is our tendency, and to say, I am gonna take steps to do it differently. It is cognitive work to listen to new audiences who don't know classical music like I do, but who are smart adults. It is cognitive work to restructure our entire org chart to break down those silos and instead build one patron loyalty team. It is cognitive work to question the requirements listed in a job description. This is a good one, you guys will love this. Why is it that we say in our job descriptions, you need a master's degree and five years experience? 
Is it possible that somebody who came from a great school like Carnegie Mellon might have a master's degree and three years experience and be absolutely qualified for that job? Is it possible that somebody who didn't have the, the privilege and opportunity to come to a school at Carnegie Mellon could maybe have a lot more experience in a different degree and still be qualified for the job? Yeah, of course, I see that in heads. It is cognitive work to say, do I really need that in my job description or are there other ways I can think of to measure who is suited to be able to do this work well? This is very orchestra specific, but it is cognitive work to question if trial weeks for a musician is really helping evaluate a player's ability or they've already won the audition or is it just giving us an out if somebody plays just fine but makes us feel a little uncomfortable. Cognitive work. And lastly, it can be done. These are some more stats for the California Symphony. I mentioned we've been selling out concerts in the 17-18 season. We had been selling out concerts so much that we added more performances. This current season, 1920, was the last season I helped plan before leaving. Same thing, we had, we had to add more concerts. Who here wants their audience to be growing so much that you have to add inventory to satisfy the insatiable demand for your art form? <laughs> Love it. Online, we made all those changes on the website in response to that Orchestra X feedback, stripped the jargon, made things in bullet points, not paragraph form, a whole bunch of other fixes in direct response to this group. And we saw a 12 to 13% lift of people moving from those landing pages on our website onto the purchase path going through to buy tickets. We started applying some of this to our season subscribers. We said, okay, if we're moving people through this pipeline of engagement, they also need uh, quick bullet point information. What's interesting about this concert? Let's try it. We then saw, I said the first year subscriber rate was about 50% nationwide. Consistently across all our subscriber segments at the California Symphony, we saw up to a 90% renewal rate for multiple years. I started off by saying 90% of first timers never come back again. We got that, that means 10% due. We got that retention rate up to 30% consistently and our subscriptions up to about 90%. All of this is a different story. All of this has been done in every other industry. None of this is new or revolutionary. It's been done and it's worked. And then we applied this as a case study to an orchestra and it also worked there. So what's happening and what I'm trying to say is this is a different story, a different narrative than almost any other orchestra in this country. I am on a mission to change the narrative for arts organizations. And I hope you all will join me. Thank you. All right, we've got some time for some questions. Yes. I have a question about what you mentioned about diversity in your target, targeting different audiences. Yeah. And I'm not just talking about having Europe, like European composed music played by people of color, but yeah. rather, do you include things from different cultures? Yes, so that was part of our programming commitment, which was just a piece of, of everything else. But yes, we say, we are, I thought I was saying 20% of our programming will be by composers of color, women composers, and that opens it up to, yeah, any culture is fine. It, but it, it helped us put numbers to it of, no, we're not gonna dip below this. Oh, and I should mention, this current season, 1920, 45% of the California Symphony's program fits that. And it's about 15% of each, so equal. Composers of color, underrepresented, are women composers, and living composers. 45%, almost half the season now. So we've even surpassed our own expectations. So the answer is yes, it opens it up. And we want to be doing that, but not doing it as a specific, here's your culturally specific concert. Good question. Yes? How do you get buy-in from the conductor and musicians? Like, was there a certain this is a great question. The question is how do you get buy-in from your musicians and your conductor? A couple, I would say the answers are different for both. For the musicians, what was so interesting to me is that when I came to the California Symphony, it was a total turnaround situation. That's the case for a lot of our organizations. And 
after, you know, we started seeing some successes pretty quickly after doing some of these things. So first year, second year there, I started having orchestra members come to me saying, I see the hall is more full. Like, th thank you. And so with the musicians, success breeds success. They saw what was happening. They like playing to a full house versus a half empty house, of course. So that really helped with just get the, the credibility of, okay, I trust my executive director that she's doing good things to advance this organization. So it really allowed for all these other things. Clap when you want, bring drinks to your seats, or I don't know, anything else that may be a little contentious. It was like, no, we got this. We, see, we, we really were able to, I think, break down some of that us versus them mentality because they saw results. For my music director, I am lucky that I had an excellent partner. So the advice, and advice for, advice for myself too, is any other orchestra job I will ever take, I will be very closely interviewing that music director as much as they are interviewing me because I firmly believe it cannot be done if it is not an equal partnership. And there were so many moments, like this diversity commitment is a great example, where uh, Donato Cabrera is his name. And Donato and I were talking and we had decided to do this commitment and I had written it all out and we knew we have to have the board as a piece of this. You can't like have everybody else in the organization be committed and the board just be a bunch of white dudes. So we said, okay, we gotta go and, and pitch this to them. And, and these are all well-intentioned people, so we didn't think it was gonna be like totally an uphill battle, but you know, the, the, the response was like a little bit of resistance. Why do we need this? Why do we, you know? And, but what was great is that because we went into this together as an equal partnership, the board saw our two leaders of this organization are asking this of us and requesting this of us. And that made a big difference. So equal partnership and um, to, to interview for that, to make sure when you take a job, when you take your first executive director job someday, make sure that artistic counterpart is with you and is a partner to you because it doesn't always play out that way. And I get this question a lot. Yeah. What else? Yes. You talked a bit about uh, breaking down the, silo the silos on your staff and I'm wondering if you can elaborate a bit on how you did that. Mm -hmm. There's a couple ways to do this. In terms of like combining departments or reorging, you can either rip the band-aid off. Some, that means some people's jobs are gonna change and shift. Especially in a turnaround situation, that needed to happen anyways. So it really was a juncture where I got to say, this is what's happening, and as the CEO, you, you can do that, and that's part of your job. Another way is, and I've seen this start to happen in some organizations too, when a senior leader is departing, department, marketing department head or development department head or something like that, that opens up some wiggle room. There's a salary cap available. There already is some juggling and transition that's going to happen. So then that's where I've gotten some calls more recently of, okay, we're already going through a transition. We've got this open head, senior head count. Now can you talk us through how to restructure? So two different ways. Yes. Um, talk a little bit about how these structural changes affected your season. How else did it change your educational and community engagement programs? Hmm. I feel like, in some ways, the education programs didn't change a lot. We were already working with a primarily Latino and Hispanic community, had a wonderful L system, have still a wonderful L system program. So that stayed the same. It was like it wasn't this other thing, this other thing over here. And so then it became, like I said, it was my head of education who was like, I'm gonna learn Spanish to help with this other thing. So really blurring those lines. Um, also, I will say it did change. Another program we have is a composer in residence program. And it did change our application process or review process, I should say, for that. So we decided, uh, this was three years ago now, our last uh, application period. It's a three year residency, so three years ago. Uh, we decided that we have got to diversify the applicant pool and the composers that we select for this program. It's a fantastic program. It's like the who's who of living composers today have been through this program, but we realized they were all white males. So we said, we gotta, we gotta do something. And so we said, in the same way that blind auditions for musicians have been found to reduce unintentional bias, help with bringing more women into the orchestra, all of that, we said, let's make a blind review process for our composer and residence program. And we did that, and then we advertised that we were gonna do that, and what happened was two application cycles ago, we had about 5% women apply. <coughs> this last application cycle, that was up to 20%, 
and every review round, 20% women advance, showing us that we think this was actually a more fair and equitable selection procedure. So that was a big one. And then lo and behold, actually it turned out that a woman won the residency last time around. And then right now, and you're the only composers in the room, applications are open right now. But, um, but, and they're doing it the same way again, blind, blind review process all the way through. So I guess in some ways our education department just became much more a part of all of this work. Yes? So on the matter of diversifying staff and audiences, um, we know especially in the beginnings of those efforts, one of the things we risk doing is tokenizing people that have previously been yes. maybe underserved or ignored, and we're bringing them into a space where they are potentially at risk of being unintentionally harmed by our implicit bias. So I yes. know you spoke to um, what you did personally in terms of, of just investigating that implicit bias. I think um, I'm curious if you could speak more to what you did on the whole of the staff so yeah. that when you are diversifying your staff and new people are coming in, that they are in an environment where um, the people around them are able to welcome them mm -hmm. as people who should be part of that community. Yeah, that's a great, the question is about tokenism. How do we avoid tokenism? Um, I always say you have to start somewhere. So for me it was, yes, I gotta educate myself and then I have to model that for everybody else. So, and it's hard, I, I usually say if we can, whether it's harder to do this on staff, a little easier to do this on the board, bring in a class of people. Because then, even if, it, if you have multiple underrepresented groups coming in together, that is helpful. If, even if you're in the case of a board, even if there's some new people, and sure, fine, they're white males, but they're great board members, even still coming in as a class of new people, uh, they're not the new one, it's the new group, they get to bond together, it helps with that. So I always on boards I recommend this. It's sometimes harder to do that on staff because you don't, you don't have three people open. You can't bring in multiple people, right? So on staff, this is where I'm still sort of working through this. I think it's gotta be, you gotta start somewhere. I was asking somebody else about this and they said, you know, have the conversation. Like, I am aware of this. Help be a part of this. Like we want to create an inclusive environment, and our commitment is that there are going to be others that we're seeking constantly to bring into the into the organization. And so, and I don't know if that's the right answer. I just know that I'm trying to figure it out as I go. And I feel like as a leader, that's what I can offer is continually trying to learn and have those conversations, even if I'm awkward about it. So that's my honest answer. Yeah. yeah. So this is very interesting. I get calls all the time where people say, how do we get the young people to come? Which was sort of the impetus for the Orchestra X project. And what I learned is that these issues are not age specific. Now it's true that sure, like baby boomers had more arts education in their life than millennials, of course that's true. But what we started seeing is there are also older adults who don't have this sort of basic foundational education. And I always say it's not basic if it was never taught in the first place. So, what was so interesting to me and a great realization is that the things we were doing, making the experience more approachable, changing the way we talk about our product, being more current in terms of our advertising, even just digital ads and things like that, people of all ages started coming and then coming back again. And so what I realized is I think if our, you know, I said so much about get our marketing not just into the 21st century but into 2020 where we almost are, when you do that, people respond. <laughs> All kinds of people. So that was a really great benefit is that we didn't do, I don't think we did anything that was like specifically for young people, but yet our audience age started shifting. Anything else? Yes. So California Symphony does how many shows a year? Five concert sets and a gala, yeah. So how do you scale this? You must be asked yes, this constantly, all the right? Time. Mm -hmm. So we have a fantastic symphony here in town, yeah. but it's significantly of course, than some yeah. of the symphonies mm -hmm. you've worked with. So then there's bureaucracy, and there's layers, and there's yeah. just um, the culture. You might even have donors that fear some of the changes mm -hmm. that you're sort of putting in. Yeah. How have you been able to scale this for bigger, mm -hmm. older organizations? You, the, and you'll forgive me, there are definitely people from the symphony here in the room, um, but I mean, we might put on, 
How many symphonies do we put on a year, guys? Oh, it's got to be like over 200 yeah, performances. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. and they do a lot. Right? Yeah. So, okay, there are sort of two questions in this. One is how do you scale everything I'm talking about, and the second is um, what did your like core audience think, mm -hmm. if I can paraphrase. Okay. So the scale question is so interesting to me. I cut my teeth at the big organization, Seattle Symphony, Seattle Opera, as I mentioned, very similar in size to Pittsburgh Symphony. And I think in many ways this work gets easier as you scale because think like all of this work, especially the long haul model, it is a lot of data. I know this is a, lot, a very data driven program. It is a lot of data. Who are our first time people? Who are the people who came twice in one season that are our multi buyers? Who are the people who are first year subscribers and we're not going to solicit them, but the second year subscribers, we are, you know, it's a lot of like manipulating all these data segments. It is much easier at a larger organization because they have a much more powerful CRM. That work is definitely easier. They also have more people, but I will say what's so interesting, every time I talk about this, I get two different responses based on big organizations. Uh, no, no. That I'll share with you the responses I get from the different size organizations. Small organizations always say, I don't know if we have the staff time and resources to do this. And big organizations always say, I don't know if we have the staff time and resources to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, the challenge is this. I say, I say to anybody in this room and anybody watching and anybody at a bigger organization, if everything that we used to do is working, then that's fine. It's working. But if we're at an organization where 90% of people, first timers aren't coming back, 50% of subscribers aren't renewing, more people are, more money's coming from single tickets and subscriptions, if that's the case and the audience is declining, then something has got to change. And we as leaders have to figure out how do we make changes to do this work. And, and like I said, it's a lot of cognitive work and it is, it is way more work to say, I gotta figure out how to restructure my organization, which is gonna be hard because some jobs might change, and, and that, that's hard stuff. That is cognitive work. It is way easier to say, let's talk about the programming, and can we do more concerts like this or that that will sell? That's a way sexier, more fun conversation, I know. So that's my answer to the big or small. I just think, I think in, some, in so many ways, it, it's easier at the bigger organizations. The question of how does my core audience feel and how will they respond, this is what's so interesting to me. Two points on this. One is at the California Symphony, most people, just like the musicians said, I see what's happening and I see the audience that's growing. That's what happened from our supporters. Our donors said, I see that this is full. I see that when I come to a concert, there are people younger than me. I see that people are having fun, that there's a different energy, that man, I better subscribe because otherwise you're gonna sell out. Thank you. That's what they said, mostly. Now this, this gets into the second part of the question, there, or second part of the answer. There are some people who don't like these changes. There always will be. Every cha change is hard, transition is hard. Oh, yeah, I'm nodding head, okay. Um, so always there will be resistance, but this is where the data matters, and this is why it's so good that CMU is a data-driven program, because what so often happens at our institutions is when a donor calls and they have a complaint, we react to that complaint. And not that we shouldn't respond, that's not what I'm saying, but there is a bias talking about knowing our own biases. There's a bias that says that we as humans think our experience is indicative of the majority. So we think if I don't like that you told people to clap when they want, I think that's rude. Everybody else or the majority of people must feel that way too. And we have to instead look at the data and in this case, it was very easy. One or two people getting upset about whatever the change is. I had a couple people, at least one that I could think of, it was like, if you tell people to applaud when they want one more time, I'm out of here. But if you look at the data, we doubled our audience. I will take that trade any day of the week. Yes. One more question? Okay, yeah. Mm. Okay, that's a great question. How do you prioritize? How do you implement? So when I first started at the California Symphony, I mentioned this turnaround situation. I mean, we had no money. So anything that was free or very little cost to implement went right to the top of the list. 
as honest. Like we had no money. So uh, that meant like copy changes on the website when you start talking about your product differently, that costs zero dollars to do. Uh, things like that. We, uh, in terms of the long haul model and like stopping soliciting people, this is a question I get a lot. When you have no money and you stop soliciting some people for a donation, doesn't that like choke up some revenue stream? And the answer is, then do the math. I give this challenge all the time. If we actually look at our databases, we would see that yes, some people do make a donation when they're called for the first time. Some people do subscribe after they're, they've been once and then are solicited. But if we look at those numbers, those are very small numbers. Or they subscribe once because they got a killer deal and then they don't renew. Or in the donor situation, it's these low level donors like came once and then made a gift. These are low little annual fund donations. That's just how it works for an entry level donor. So if we do the math, it's not that much revenue. And that's why it's called the long haul model because we are saying I will sacrifice some revenue in the short term so that over time I can make way more, which is only to fund the art. That's why. So in terms of prioritizing, also when you start focusing on loyalty, it's not only a revenue loss situation, you see more people coming. So actually at the California Symphony, my first year there, we were able to grow the audience by 14% that first year through the donor base. That was the first year they had a break even budget in like 10 years. And that was my first year on the job doing this work. So in terms of priority, what it was was the short answer. Free things got put at the top, loyalty activities got put at the top. And then as we had more money, then it was a late, four years later, redesign the website type projects. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you again, guys. This was a real pleasure. So thanks for having me.